Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sunday morning for, I think it is our 10th week of separation, and certainly we're not very thrilled with it. We have been uh, missing you all, and uh, I'm sure that you are as frustrated as we are with the slow return to normalcy, and and we are hoping and praying it will be soon. Uh, There's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 21, I think it's verse 1, that says the The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and like the rivers, he can turn it wherever he wants. And so would you pray for our governor and mayor and and those that make decisions here that we would just see God's hand upon them and that this uh, slowdown would speed up so we can get back to what I think the Lord would have for us to do in, in, in gathering together. So pray. And we'll pray with you and let you know. If you haven't gone to our website, we have a a page now that will advise you of what we are doing to get ready to reopen, things that we'll probably have to do for a while from a safety standpoint that we are more than willing to do. But take a look there at what we expect from you and what you can expect from us in in the next uh, few weeks as we wait this out. Also, our offices are open every day, as I think we've told you, Uh, from 8 to 5. If you need something, please call us. If you can't get out, if you need something picked up, if you're in trouble, if you just want to pray, maybe this has gotten to you and and who doesn't get to it one time or another. So just call. We'd love to pray with you and and continue to just stand with you as we uh, look to the Lord. You know, this is a worldwide thing. God's in charge of the world, so we're going to rest in Him. Well, let's pray and we'll, we'll start our services this morning. Thank you for joining us. You know, sing along, would you? I know uh, you're going to have to listen to yourself. and I'm, uh, Not just, I don't have to hear you, you have to hear you. <laughs> but the Lord is, is tin deaf in his ears. He just loves a heart that wants to worship. Father, thank you this morning for gathering us together. And it, it, we do pray, Lord, for a quick resolve to what seems to be endless. And maybe on a political standpoint, it will be. And, and we'll have to make some other decisions. But for now, Lord, we just pray your... Your hand would be upon our leadership in the government. You've placed them there. And turn their hearts, Lord, would you, as we look to you. May you speak to us this morning. Thank you for bringing us together for the technology that allows us to to worship, to teach, to learn, to to have fellowship for our small groups on the Zoom app to be able to get together. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for the people that are getting saved. We thank you for the, the new... Congressman Mike Garcia that came to know you just a few weeks ago. Ask that you would use him. So be with us this morning. Be glorified in this place. We, we want to hear from you as we come to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Well, let's all stand. That's right. You can put your coffee down. Go ahead and stand. And if you're still laying in bed, that's okay. You can stand in bed too because we're going to worship the Lord together. Amen.
His praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. When I was lost, you rescued me.
Thank you, Lord, and praise you. Lord, we want to continue in this place of worship this morning as we have the opportunity to be part of the body of Christ. And as we, you have called us, Lord, to assemble together, whether it is here in this place or in our homes, Lord, we want to honor and glorify your name. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can rely on your sovereignty during this time of uncertainty, that you are always the same, and that we can always put our trust in you, Lord God. We do pray that you would continue to allow your peace to reign in our hearts, Lord, in every way. And as we also have opportunity to be part of the work of what you're doing here at Morningstar, we ask that you would now bless our tithes and our offerings, those that we would give to you, Lord, of a cheerful heart. And may you receive them and may you give wisdom to their use. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. What love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called His Son. Greater love this world had never seen. When he hung on the tree, oh, why would he do such a thing for dirty sinners like you and me, oh God?
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Worthy of 
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, Father, that's our prayer this morning. That we would live our lives for you. In such a way, Father, that others would know Jesus because of what you've done in our lives and that, and that we can share your love, Father, to those all around us. And as we take this time this morning, Father, to, to open up your word, may you show us that to live a life that is just constantly working and seeking to just fill our pocketbooks and fill our garages and every other aspect of our life, Father, with just a bunch of things that are all vanity, Father, your word says. We can't take any of it with us, Father, but we, what we can take is what you've given to us that's deep within our hearts. In your love, Father, may we share your love with those around us. So go before our time of study now and bless Pastor Jack as he comes to teach us. It's in your great holy name that we all pray and everyone said, amen. 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 Well, let's get our Bibles out this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes, verse 12 of chapter 1. Last week we started our journey through this book. It, I think, will take us maybe six months or so if the Lord gives us all that time to complete it. But it is a, a journal written by David's son, King Solomon. As he was given by the Lord great wisdom more than every other man to rule God's people as he prayed after his dad died. Riches and power and, and honor and gifts. And for a young man, for a while, he did fine. But it, later on in life, marrying a lot of different wives, some of them no doubt for political expediency, we find his heart turned away from the Lord and Solomon goes on a quest to find life in this world apart from a relationship with God. He had the wherewithal to do so. And he kept a note log, a journal, if you will, this book, to tell us what he concluded. They're not always the right conclusions, but they are accurately recorded as a man who wanted to find life without God. This book is included in what we call the Old Testament books of wisdom or poetry. And those are unique. They're written in the present tense, all of them. They make the presumption that if you are reading them, you want to have your relationship with the Lord strengthened and that you can apply them directly then to your life. These poetic books, which start with Job and run here to, uh, pass here to the Song of Solomon, um, ask the big question is in life. The book of Job addresses why do the righteous suffer? The, the book of Psalms, maybe more than anything else, how do I pray? And how do I seek God in my situation? The book of Proverbs talks about applying God's wisdom to daily life. And then we get this book, Solomon's journey as he walks away from the Lord, tries to find meaning and purpose, satisfaction and hope in a life that doesn't include God. So he sets out to find answers. He, he calls this, this life, life under the sun, life under heaven a horizontal plane, if you will, of life. Um, the good news is, if you haven't read ahead, <laughs> that by the time he gets to chapter 12, he realizes that he, he needs to go back where he came from, which was walking with God and seeking him, and that's where life really is found. And so I fully expect to see Solomon in heaven one day. He, he, he makes this kind of circuitous route, but he returns to where he began. I read an article a while back that I thought was kind of humorous, and it does apply. There was an ad in a local paper for a parachute, and it said of the parachute, it was nearly new, it had never been opened, but it was slightly stained. And I thought, you know, that's kind of the way life is. You only get to live it once. You don't really get any redos. If you that are golfers, you don't get a mulligan. <laughs> you don't get to try it over. You better get it right. So we do want to know and be sure that the path that we're on is leading to where God wants us to be, that, that the, the life that we're leading will satisfy. And so Solomon 
sets off into the world with those kind of questions. What's going to make me happy? If you look at any recent polls, and people ask this all the time from a sociological standpoint, the answers have always been the same. Money and power and relationships and job and success. Um, so Solomon will try to, to run down those avenues. And, and I'm glad that you're joining us. I hope that you'll be with us every week. Um, because one kind of dead end to the other, he chases down these various paths of these elusive dreams that the world really has. And I think as such as Christians, this book really, really does equip you to, to share with the lost. Because you're going to find them on this kind of journey at some point, And you'll be able to share what Solomon has learned. Well, last week we did the first 11 verses. We met the man, Solomon, the preacher. The, the Hebrew word is koheleth. It is a word that means to search for or to discover or to, to, to gather together. The, the word in Hebrew is ekklesia, church, but it means to gather things. That's the word ecclesiastes. And, and like I said, it is a uh, under the sun kind of hunt for life, under the sun apart from God, on this world, in this life. Um, in verse 2, Solomon concluded, and he gives us a view of, or an, an insight into what he's going to conclude, that, that life without God is, is vanity. The word is habel. It means emptiness or, or futility or meaninglessness, if you will. He, he uses the word some 37 times. Most of them are found in this book in the Old Testament. There you find it a couple of other places. But, but that's his view. Last week we, we, we looked at a couple of verses. He, he's, he found life to be meaningless and, and kind of monotonous and, and a vic vicious cycle. There, nothing seems to change. Nothing seems to be new. Well, this morning uh, we join with Solomon in verse 12 and he turns from his conclusions, which he kind of gives us here and at the end, to giving us how he came to them, if you will. And, and here, beginning in verse 12, you'll see the fir first person pronoun change to I. Solomon begins to give you uh, some of his report. Now, just want to remind you, Solomon was the wealthiest man on the planet, the wisest man that ever lived, according to God's estimation of him and what he gave him, the most powerful king. So he was able to pursue these dreams and these hopes even more than we will ever be able to if we think somehow there's a prize at the end of the, of the run, you know, at the, at the end of the pursuit. So um, with, with each passing day, though, he, he seemed to sink deeper and deeper into the despair that says, well, this didn't work, maybe this will, and, and maybe this will work, and at some point, and, and we don't know how many years Solomon ran down these paths, but he, we do know that he came up at the last, and he realized where he had gone wrong. Under the sun, he uses that phrase 29 different times to speak about um, horizontal perspective. Just one more thing to remind you before we look at our verses this morning down through chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, Solomon does mention God about 40 times or so, but he never really uses the term Yahweh or Jehovah, which is the, the God of, of, of covenant, the, the intimacy that God wants you to know him by the God of fellowship and promise. He, he always just knows him as Elohim, which is the generic, I think, name of God in the secular mind. He's unapproachable, he's, he's unknowing, he's all-powerful, he's supreme, he's mighty, but he can't really be known. And so in all of those years that Solomon was on the run, that's how he knew the Lord. So this morning, we're going to look at three things, three dead ends to Solomon's way of thinking that he went down the road to try to, to, try to find life under the sun, under heaven, without God. He, he goes down the path of education. I'm sure if I'm smart enough and learned enough, I'm going to be satisfied. He goes down the path of enjoyment. If pleasure is king, boy, could this guy throw a party. And then finally, down the, the, the road of employment, success, accomplishment, Three dead ends, and they usually draw huge crowds in the world. This is, this is what people work for. This is what they, they long to do. Uh, and yet, there is no satisfied, happy life at the end of them, as he thought. Well, he begins with education, verse 12. And let's begin there. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my heart to seek and to under search 
by wisdom concerning everything that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by, to, by which they are being exercised. I have seen all the work that is done under the sun, and indeed it is all vanity. It is a grasping for the wind. For what is crooked can't be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I communed with my heart. I said, look, I have attained greatness, have gained wisdom more than anyone before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. And so I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. But I perceived that this was also a grasping for the wind. For with much wisdom comes much grief. And with an increase of knowledge comes an increase of sorrow. So Solomon begins with the path, the dead-end path, of being an educator or education. He's a scholar, a, a thinker, and uh, a, 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 an educator, I guess, would be the word. And notice in verse 13, we read of him saying he's going to seek and search out by wisdom. He's going to carefully investigate life, look at it all sides, ask all of the questions, analyze, get to the root of the matter, roll up his sleeves. He's, he's like the guy, you know, going to get his doctoral dissertation or master's thesis. He's going he's to flush this out. This is going to be the answers to life. But he quickly defines life, notice in verse 3, as not only life under the sun, but he sees it through his wor worldly wisdom without God involved as some burdensome task, some hurtful occupation that God has given to man to exercise him. The word literally means to afflict or to wear out, or to bring fatigue to. Even when he began, because he had set God aside, and so he was left with the, the wisdom of the, that's horizontal, Solomon, with all of his brains, went, this is like, this will wear you out. God has given this to us to just wear us out. Now, that's not the case when you read the Bible. It, it, it certainly wasn't God's plan initially for man to be struggle. If you read early on in Genesis, you know, it was sin that brought suffering and Paul said to the Romans in chapter 8, you know, to this day we are groaning within to be delivered uh, because of this, this weariness and this travail that we're in, even until now. He said all of creation is groaning. Well, that's right. But, but if you don't have the Lord involved, where do you turn? And to Solomon, who had walked away from God, he saw life just that way. Solomon was a very powerful king. He lived... Or I should just say he reigned for 40 years in Jerusalem at a time when there was unparalleled peace. He had plenty of time to, to, to not be occupied with war. There was none. So, you know, he had visit, visitor, the queen of Sheba came. He was uh, exposed to people of great genius and, and power and, and varied experiences. He hosted them. He communed with them. We can read. He, he learned from them. And yet... Solomon, which, who had been given this great wisdom by God, this heavenly gift, set it aside so that he could somehow figure out life without God, which, which tells us something. You know, you can go to church every week, get your Bible out every day, but if you don't make use of, apply, live in and walk uh, in the, the knowledge that God gives you, that knowledge is completely useless. Now, now notice the words here, and I'll, I'll just read them real quickly in verse 13. Solomon says, I set my heart. In verse 16, he said, I communed with my heart. In chapter 2, verse 1, we'll get there in just a minute, he said, I set, I set in my heart. And then in verse 2, I searched with my heart. Now look, he's not looking for God, to God for help here. He's just looking within and then looking around and coming to the conclusions that he thinks he can gather together. And, and no wonder he's frustrated. But that, a lot of people like this in the world. They don't have the Lord, but they have great education. They're, they're smart. They, they, they have the applause of their peers, but they have no peace. There, there's that old saying, if you look around, you'll be distressed. And if you look within, you'll be depressed. But you've got to look up to Jesus to find rest. And that he wasn't willing to do. Notice in, in verse 16 here, as we read these verses, that, that Solomon's arrogant attitude about his own wisdom was, look, I, I know more than everyone else. So I'm sure that I'm going to be able to go down this path of wisdom that no one has like I have and be able to find life. But look, you can, you can read it in a book, but if it isn't getting into your heart, 
And, and by the way, he wasn't so smart on his own. He, he admitted to that when, when he was made king, when his dad died. He said, the Lord, I, I don't have what it takes to even rule as my father did. Lord, give me your wisdom. And it was God's wisdom that was given to him. But look, if you're real smart in the world, there is more than likely an attitude of superiority that, that crawls in. Paul wrote to the uh, Corinthians in chapter 8 of the first Corinthian letter. He said, uh, knowledge will puff you up <laughs> while love will edify you. And so we find Solomon there. And, and he draws several conclusions about life in terms of education and wisdom and worldly learning. And, and he sets them before us here in verses 14 and 15 and 16. No, it's actually skip 16, verse 17 and 18 as well. Notice in verse 14, he said, of all of the works under the sun, when he really applied himself to learning, he came up with the fact that, that life in the, the education field, if that's where you're finding life, is, is going to be empty. It's going to be without substance. The word vanity literally means what do you have left over. And when he put his mind to it, he said there isn't anything left here. There's no life here. In fact, he described it here as a grasping for the wind. Grasping of the wind. He says it twice in verse 14 and in verse 17. It's impossible to grasp the wind. It goes right through your fingers. There it is. Uh, now I don't have it. In other words, it's unattainable to find real life apart from God just by turning to wisdom and, and learning. And he shares his insights here in verse 15 by, by talking about how frustrating it is that as much as he's learned, he can't make a crooked path straight. And, and from all that he's learned, that, that there is more lacking than there are answers. So if this is the place you're looking to fulfill your life, you know, man is lacking in, in more than what you can count, and there is no power in the wisdom of man to do anything on a long-term basis. So... He concluded, as he writes his journal, as he's out there in the world seeking life, that, that in the short term you might find some satisfaction, but the bottom line is you're not getting anything done. We can't change the heart of a, of a person. Uh, you know, you might, I'm sure, have heard the arguments when there is a mass shooter or something, that, gosh, we just need to eliminate guns. But that's not the problem. The problem is the gunman. And how do we change his heart? We don't and can't lock up everything that someone can use to carry forth their wickedness. Man doesn't have a solution. God does. He'll change the heart. And Solomon discovered what we as Christians should know very well, that, that man can't save himself, that only God can straighten out what sin has broken and bent. Right? We, we read in Jeremiah chapter 13, I think, verse 23, that, that, that the Lord is the only one who can make crooked things straight and change a leopard's spots. With him, all things are possible. When, when the rich young man walked away and, and the Lord said, how hard is it for a rich man to get into heaven? The, the apostle said, well, man, who can be saved? And, and, and the Lord said, with man, that would be impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So we are born with a, a bent for sin. Jesus said to Nicodemus in chapter 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. We are bent to sin. That, it's in our DNA. It, it, our education won't change the bent, can't change the lean, can't reverse the problem that was in the hearts. In fact, Jesus went on and he said, that which is born of the spirit is spiritual. And that's what we need, this new birth. So as Solomon spends some time walking down the halls of academia, you know, he pessimistically reports in verse 18 that much wisdom brings much grief and it increases sorrow. In other words, there's no life there. If that's your hope for life, I just got to be the smartest guy in town. I'm going to know things. Solomon says it's just going to make you more sad than ever. I, I remember re reading one, one somewhere that philosophy is the, the study that allows people to be unhappy more intelligently. And, and that is indeed biblically the case. You know, a, stu a student may do his uh, homework, or, or I, I should just say a stu student may read this and go, well, I guess I'm doing homework is of no value, but that's not what 
Solomon is saying. He's just saying you can't find life. It's not worth living if, if your arena, if your hope is in the education department. Education by itself leaves him empty. And those who live this life by explanation and only what they fully understand will, will be quickly frustrated because there'll be more questions than answers. But God has more answers. And though he doesn't always explain himself on this side of heaven, he does explain himself and prove himself enough to where we can rest in the fact that though we don't understand, he does. And we can find our rest in him. The more you learn about the world, the more insight you gain, the worse you often feel. There's such limitations to worldly wisdom. Just look at what we've done with this virus reporting and, and what we should and shouldn't do and where it can and can't come from. And, and people are confused. And these are the smart people that are telling us these things. Education is not the answer for man, isn't the answer for your children, isn't an answer for the world. It's needful, it's wonderful, and it's place with the Lord involved, but it can never bring you the solution for sin or man's wickedness or the need to have his heart changed. All of that is, is outside the realm of education in the world, of wisdom. And so Solomon's worldly wisdom can't straighten out a person's life. It will just make him increasingly aware of his inability to do anything at all, to make a significant difference. Worldly wisdom can't cure our ills, and it certainly can't answer the cry of the heart. Just educate people, they say. But look, if that was the case, if education was the, the answer, you would think you could go to our college campuses and they would be the paragons of peace and joy. You would find more joy there and answers than anyone, because these are kids devoted to learning. Instead, they're magnets for controversy and unrest and disillusionment. And the smarter people get, the more pessimistic they become, and the more they want to distance themselves from the world. So Solomon said, I tried that route. I tried to go down the education route. Daniel, in writing his pro prophecy to us in chapter 12, verse 4, said that in the last days, knowledge would increase. Today, our collective understanding and wisdom literally doubles every two years. With a few keystrokes on your computer, you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about a subject. You may not even understand everything that you read, but I guarantee it's available to you. Country, education, income, GMP, history. Look it up. Try this, though. Try typing in, what do I have to do to be happy and satisfied in heart? That they don't have a, an answer for. So when the mass shooter comes out and he you know, the people want to address education and psychology and restriction and restraint. And then the mass shooter kills himself and everyone cries, he didn't get justice. It's because those answers aren't found there. God's word has answers. God's spirit can change the heart. Satan offers his wisdom to Eve. He said, eat of the, the fruit that the Lord told you not to eat of, and you can be smart. You can be like God. You can know good from evil. Well, you can know evil, but to know good, you have to come to know him. So every set of accomplishments in man's history has always brought with it all kinds of setbacks, from, from jet planes to televisions to insecticide to video games to the Internet. Whatever is good brings with it all kinds of distress. It's just the way life is. The wiser we become, the worse things get. And still there's no answer in sight. So Solomon, in his journal, he writes, I've tried it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Secondly, in chapter 2, he, he writes then, well, let me try pleasure and, and the enjoyment of kind of a carefree party life. <laughs> You've probably heard that before. He says in verse 1 of chapter 2, I said in my heart, come now, let me test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy your pleasure but certainly, this also was vanity. I said to laughter and madness and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guarding, uh, guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold of, of folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. <clears throat> so another path, another endeavor, another hopeful road 
This time, education, forget it. There's no life there. I'm just finding out more problems. So I'll just live the carefree life. The word mirth means merriment or pleasure or laughter, outward enjoyment. <coughs> I would say, just knowing what I do about Solomon, that if anyone could throw a party, party this guy could. You know, he would have been a hedonist on all cylinders. He would have been the original party animal of 10th century B.C. If you go back over to chapter 4 of 1 Kings and you begin to read <coughs> excuse me, all of the, um, the provisions that were being made for his house every day, the, the, the amount of food and, and meat and, 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 and provision, you easily come to the conclusion that there were thousands of people who d depended upon Solomon's table for eating and for, for just getting by. <coughs> this guy had unlimited resources. He had unlimited uh, curiosity. He had no accountability, if you will. He could have partied on, dude, <laughs> as much as he liked. So in his searching, in his experimentation, Solomon looked to find satisfaction in entertainment. He wanted to laugh. Let me just laugh. Verse 2, I said to laughter. <coughs> I wanted to laugh. <coughs> And I found it to be empty and mad. And verse 2, what does it really accomplish? You know, if you read through the Bible, one of the things you'll come to, the, I think, to the conclusion of almost immediately is that God wants his people filled with joy. That he would like you to just enjoy his blessings. If you read Psalm 104, the Lord says very clearly that that's really his will, will for, for you and for me. Um, when Paul wrote to Timothy and warned him about the riches of this world and, and trusting in them, he said, look, just enjoy the richness that God gives to all of us to enjoy. So the Lord has a, a heart where he wants his people filled with joy. Nearly every Jewish feast day, holiday, practice in the Old Testament, had an integral part of, of the, the idea of rejoicing in God's goodness and, and provision. The harvest time was always thanking the Lord for his, for his provision. In, in fact, when you get to the end of this book, in chapter 12, Solomon will conclude, you know, remember thy creator in the days of your youth when the evil days have not come and the end draws near and you say, because of your old age, I'm not finding great pleasure in them today and the aging progress. But, but he said, you should rejoice and, and and enjoy the provisions that God has made. <clears throat> so again, here's Solomon on a uh, horizontal plane, testing to see if there's, there's life in the life of abandonment. If I can just drink and indulge my flesh, maybe that would be good. You know, I could laugh. I mean, the Bible says laughing is good for you. It's good for your soul. It, 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 but sometimes laughing just covers up a great deal of pain, doesn't it? I mean, if you read of the, some of the lives of our great comics of our generation, they are oftentimes just, you know, their wit hides their pain and their loneliness, their addictions and their depressions. Solomon wrote in verse 3 here, so, you know, let me try to f gratify my flesh with wine while trying to guard or, or guide my heart with wisdom. Interesting, Solomon wasn't a fall-down drunk in the gutter with a, a paper bag hiding his Thunderbird wine bottle. Solomon was a sophisticated, wealthy guy with a tuxedo on and a constant buzz with a champagne glass in his hand. He looked okay, but he thought this is where life can certainly be found, and yet he couldn't find it there. He searched his heart, notice, to learn how to drink and be happy and still be wise. He filled his life under heaven with those things he thought would satisfy, and at the end of the day, when the party was over and the guests went home, Solomon looked around at the mess and said, this isn't it either. This is not it. This is not where life is found. In his earlier days, as he wrote the first part of Proverbs in chapter 4, he, he had written that um, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end there is the, those are the ways of death. 
And then he wrote, even in his laughter, his heart can find great sorrow. And even in his mirth, he can find tremendous grief. Now, he had learned that from the Lord. That was God's wisdom. But now he was off to find life exactly there. And he was learning the hard way that those verses in Proverbs were absolutely right. Look, there's nothing wrong with some pleasure and some laughter and some frivolity. You know, <laughs> I think we all need to relieve ourselves sometimes of, of all the pressures of life. But it's not, the, it's not that. It's trying to find life there as if somehow that's our, our hope. And, and with every kind of, of intense of, you know, enjoyment of pleasure in a, in a fleshly sense, pretty soon you want more. That's why people move on to harder drugs. That's why people start, you know, nobody starts off as an alcoholic. They have to work at it. And work at it they do. But they are all driven by this truth of diminishing return. So that's not our greatest need. Our greatest need is to know God. Our flesh might tell you otherwise, but your spiritual life is the important one. Jesus said, if you lose your life, then you can find it. Solomon makes a great argument for that. He said, um, this party life is not going to do it for me, this, this path of pleasure. Education won't do it. Enjoyment won't do it. So he, he turns to employment. Maybe if I find myself and, 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 and bury myself in the whole idea of, of gain and business and success, maybe that will do it. So we read in verse 4. So I made my works great. I built houses, planted vineyards for myself. I made for myself gardens and orchards, planted them with all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which water would uh, water the uh, which, from which the uh, the water would come for, for growing trees of the grove. I, I acquired male and female servants. Had servants even born in my house. Yes, I had great possessions of herds and flocks. Then all who were in Jerusalem before me, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of the king and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, musical instruments of all kinds. And so I became great and excelled in them all who were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me. So Solomon turns from the... Uh, the first two roads to a third one. Let me try to go down the road of acquiring, of building, of wealth, of accomplishment. Because, you know, you always feel good when you've done something well. Something you've built, something you've invested in. Notice that the emphasis in these verses is the word I. Just read them through again or, or just look at them. And you'll see that, that, that Solomon was interested in creating his own environment. Right? Right? It's kind of like, I, 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 if I could just do this. So I buy the house that I think are the house of my dreams, and I stay there a few years. Well, this isn't it, and I wish I could move, and I find a house that I can't afford, but if I had that, then I'd be happy. And so you go from the one thing to the next thing. And Solomon was, was a master builder. He spent 20 years building the temple. About the longest we're going to take building the fellowship. 20 years but all of the materials had already been gathered by his father, <clears throat> and all of the financing had already been provided. He was just a perfectionist. It was a wonder of the ancient world. When that was done, he spent 13 years building his own house. He then he built a, a summer palace in the forest of Lebanon, and then he built a place for one of his 300 wives, my goodness, uh, one of the daughters of Pharaoh, then he built Gezer, and then he built Hazor, and then he built Megiddo, and then he built Beth Horon, places you'll find in the Bible. He was an out-of-control builder, off-the-hook ambition, and he just couldn't be satisfied. But he sought to make a name for himself in building and developing and creating. Nothing wrong with any of that. Our God is a creator. He gives us ambition. However, there's no satisfaction there without a relationship with God, without a purpose for those things. And that's the key. And that was Solomon. Solomon was like Nero. Nero had a Solomon complex. You know, he, he built for self-satisfaction. He, he came to Rome and it was just a city of bricks and he left and it was a city of marble, but he put his name on everything. This is all that he was <clears throat> wanting to do. 
You maybe have stopped by, or if you haven't, maybe uh, seen the sign on the, up in uh, Northern California called, of a place called the Winchester House in San Jose. Um, it's an amazing place. It has 160 rooms in it, uh, 47 fireplaces, three elevators, 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, only 13 bedroom, uh, bathrooms, six kitchens, no rhyme or reason, half the place doesn't go anywhere. It, it, it's almost a, a living example to Solomon going, man, just build something, and it just didn't satisfy. The, the story behind it is interesting because uh, Sarah, uh, who married uh, her husband William, who happened to be the son of the fellow that founded the Winchester repeating rifle, uh, she got married in the, I think, in the early 1860s or so. Uh, no, actually got married in 1862, I think, 1862. But four years later, her, her daughter died of, of acute malnutrition. They thought they were taking good care of her, and she wasn't getting enough to eat, though they were very wealthy. Um, it, it caused Sarah Winchester to go, fall into a deep depression. Fifteen years later, her husband <clears throat> died of tuberculosis. And she, living in the, um, on the East Coast, went to seek a spiritualist to find out what was wrong was her life cursed? Uh, she was told by the spiritualist that her husband had made rifles that had killed American Indians and Civil War soldiers and others, and so the, the death of her husband and their daughter were the spirits coming to get even, and they were next coming for her. And she said, well, what could I do? And they said, you should go and build a house for them, and as long as construction continues, you'll be safe. And so she, she packed up and went and moved to Menlo, Menlo uh, Park, California, started building on this little uh, spot in the Santa Clara uh, Valley, bought a home, and she was extremely wealthy. I think she was, I think her, her kickback from her investments in stocks were well over $1,000 a day, which was just remarkably much in the, in the late 1880s. Um, so she just kept building, and building, and building, and building, and every day just paying for people to keep building. And it didn't matter if the door stopped somewhere, it didn't lead to anywhere. She just wanted to have life. And when she died in, in September of 1922, um, I think she had heart failure. <laughs> um, the building stopped as well, and so you can go and see it today. It, like it stands on six or seven acres. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But, but look at Solomon. Solomon said to himself, not at all driven by this, but certainly by the same wrong thinking, hey, I'm sure that there's great joy and satisfaction <coughs> in life in, a, in accomplishing this idea of building. Solomon turned to gardening. Notice he built water pools to water his groves. If you go to Hebron in Israel, um, and we don't always go to Hebron anymore on our trips because of um, kind of the governments over them, and maybe we'll get to go this next time. But there are three pools in Hebron, and they're all exactly the same, 230 feet wide, 420 feet long, and 50 feet deep. And, and the parks around them must have been beautiful, but they suspect that that's where Solomon's uh, place was. I think it was Ted Turner, who at least years ago was a kind of a big builder. He once said of his building life, life is like a, 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 a B-grade movie you, you don't want to leave in the middle of it, but you, ever, you don't ever want to see it again either. He didn't find much satisfaction in it at all. And, and notice in verse 7 that Solomon then turned from, from accomplishment to gain to acquiring. The more, the better. And, and he started talking about having a huge labor force. In fact, uh, you know, he kept families with him and took care of them. They were born to him, other children, to the slaves that he had. If you go back to 1 Kings, I think, chapter 5, it says that there were 30,000 people of his own people from Israel that he put to work quarrying uh, stones in, in Lebanon for the building of the temple and then in Jerusalem as well. Uh, in, in verse 7 and verse 8, he, he talks about acquiring more than everyone else, flocks and herds and gold and silver, by the way, and horses, things that the Lord said, don't, the king shouldn't do that. Uh, that's exactly what he did. In fact, if you read in, I think it's 1 Kings chapter 10, about the gold that Solomon gathered, they said silver was worth nothing in Solomon's day. But what he owned in gold, 20 tons of gold, <clears throat> would be worth about $1.3 trillion today at, at $1,800 an ounce, let's say. 
Um, but even that, notice in verse 10 and verse 11 as we get here, those aren't good enough. He, he gathered music, the delights of music and musical instruments, verse 8 and verse 9. He, he had a, probably a museum of musical instruments, one of the kinds that no one could afford but him. We are told in 1 Kings that he was a composer, that he wrote 1,005 uh, songs for himself, that he filled his house with performers. I'm sure he could hire the best that money could buy, and maybe the music comforted him for a minute, but then the woes kind of rolled back in. Um, it's interesting, from the Bible standpoint, music is God's gift to, to man in general. Everyone seems to love it. We don't all agree on styles, um, but we enjoy them as God's grace. Yet, if there's not an attachment to the Lord, music cannot fill you. It cannot be an end to your, to your life. It can't, it can't be the end all, if you will. I grew up with, with icons or, or people that I loved watching. And, you know, looking back, I realized a lot of the musicians I, I looked up to and liked were miserable. John Bonham, who was Led Zeppelin's drummer, died, I think, at 32 of an uh, alcoholic over overdose. Janis Joplin, heroin overdose at 27. Jimi Hendrix, drug overdose at 28. Elvis, not a little before my time, but... He died of an accidental overdose of over-the-counter medication, I think, at 42. Michael Jackson was 50. Amy Winehouse with alcoholic, alcoholic poisoning died at 27. Whitney Houston drowned, but her battle with drugs is, is well known. Uh, Matthew, no, no, Tommy Marks uh, the, fell from the, the Killers, the, the band, died at 33, took his own life. So. Lots of music, hey, lots of success, great things to sing along with, but man, Solomon is right. No life there. He, he, he had tried it all. Notice what he says in verse 9. So I became great and excelled more than everyone in Jerusalem, and, and my wisdom remained with me. Unfortunately, he didn't apply it. <laughs> it stayed with him all right. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. My heart rejoiced in my labors. This was my reward for my labors. And I looked at the work of my hands that they had done in the fields in which I had toiled indeed. This too was emptiness or, or vanity and a grasping for the wind. There was no profit for it under the sun. Ultimately, any temporary satisfaction that you find of life in the world, that will be the extent of your full reward. You better look carefully. It's kind of, you know, if, if you hear the applause, you better listen, because that's your reward. Temporary. But when everything is finished, notice verse 11, when, 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 when all is said and done, the heart is still empty, the journey brought pleasure, but the destination did not. Only more emptiness. So, Look, sin is fun, fun for a while, fun for a season. It's a blast until the reward is due. And the Bible says sin is indefinitely pleasurable for a season, but then the, the emptiness rolls in um, like a vengeance. So, look, as a pastor for the last 40 years, I'm the guy people come talk to when they find out that everything they've been chasing for hasn't satisfied. And if it isn't the Lord is involved, look, when the Lord is involved, you can take the most menial job and, and the, the least amount of accomplishment and just have as little as maybe life can offer, but with God's relationship or with your relationship with him, life has purpose and meaning and, and great satisfaction. So, you know, <laughs> we can either get our perspective and our goals from the life that, that the world offers or that Solomon says, look, that's not going to help you. And education alone will produce a wise, miserable sinner. Wine and women and song will produce a giddy, temporarily happy sinner. Give someone honor and success, you'll find a wealthy sinner. But bring them to Jesus, and you'll find a sinner filled with joy and hope and purpose and life. Solomon's lesson, and it will be repeated from every angle, 
It won't be just repeated. I think there's lots of depths here, but look, take it from a guy who has been there. In the long run, this isn't the place you look. Don't look at life under the sun. Look up. So do that, would you? As you have a time to sit home, and maybe you've never had to slow down as much as you have, and so you have to look at yourself maybe more than, you know, you can't be distracted so much. And maybe that's what the Lord wants to speak to all of us about. Without him, life is empty in the long run. It's not going to take you where you want to go. But the, bo the book, this, and I'm glad it's only chapter 12 chapters, so we, you know, <laughs> get through it. But the lesson is important. You find life with him nowhere else. Shall we pray? Father, thank you this morning for speaking to our hearts. And I know that, that certainly, Lord, for, for most of us, we came out of a world that, that the things that Solomon is chasing down were the things that we hoped in our lives we could accomplish, that we could gain, that we could gather, that we could you know, be on top and have more than most and be wiser than others and, and, and live the carefree life and, and be successful to wherever we turn. And yet we listen to Solomon who had the wherewithal to, 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 to chase all these things down to the max. And yet he was the one that says to us, there's nothing here. There's nothing to be found. May we realize that as we have to make decisions whether to, to go to church or, or, or work 80 hours a week. Or, or are we going to have time to find, get our Bibles out and spend some time with the Lord? Or are we just so busy chasing whatever it is that's before us that we're, we're sacrificing the one person in the one way that brings life? Look, God has life for you and, and joy for you. And, and wants to, to fulfill your heart with great accomplishments to his glory, for his honor. But if you remove him from the equation, life is a waste of time. Because whatever you can accomplish, it won't take you to life with him. And that's the lesson, that's the warning. And we need to take that to a heart this morning. Tom's going to lead us in a a song before we go our way and, and just to know, you know, we love you guys. We're, we're praying for you. We, we miss you terribly. And we're praying that God would just allow us to quickly begin to gather with care and, and yet with purpose. Because I think that ultimately that's going to be his desire for us. So let's song, sing this together before we go our way. To marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth?
Thank you, Lord. Pray this this morning you would go with us. Remind us what road to stay on, that narrow road that leads to life. A few find. And yet you brought us here. May we not be disillusioned by the world or taken down and away from you where our true life is found. And may you remind us and even be able to use these verses to talk to those in the world. Hey, look, this is where, exactly where Solomon went. And look what he found. May you use us this week as we continue to just reach out with your love in this world that is just so lost. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. See you soon.